Hello. So um, I've just got a new computer, so it's very exciting, but I'm hoping that everything goes all right for this video right now. So I'm Gigi Parker Hudnell. I am your instructor for Drama 1310 Theater Appreciation. And today we're gonna to be talking about um, chapter two in the theater brief by Cohen and Sherman. And it's about what is a play. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So chapter two, what is a play? When we're talking about a play, what is it exactly that we're talking about? Um, so we're gonna to try to define a play in a couple of different ways. So a play is not a book. It's not something that you read. We say, oh, I read a play today. Um, but that's not really what a play is. A play is what happens when you're in the theater. It's, a, it's an event, it's something that happens. Um, the word drama comes from the Greek word drawn, which means something done. So it's not something read, it's something that we've done, something that we're doing. Uh, another definition is that it's a, a form of perceived action. It's focused around a particular conflict. Something happens in the play. We're watching a play because it's exciting. Something's happening in the play. Um, and that particular conflict is focused around so that it can become art. So both Aristotle in the fifth century BC and Anatyasastra um, is a, another document that was written around the same time, but it was written in um, India, excuse me. And both of them, thousands of miles away, around the same time, wrote these kind of dialogues about what good theater is. And although they're not quite the same, they did agree on a lot of the different things. And they both agreed that plays are more elevated than everyday life. So we don't just go to see a play to see, you know, what we could see in our, around our kitchen table. We wanna see something that's a little different, a little elevated. And play gives us the structure that we lack in life. So when you go see a play, there is a structure around it. There's a method to it and everything. Um, whereas on regular life, you know, anything could happen, but it also reflects truth. Okay, the whole reason that you would write a play or, you know, that we would want to see a play is so that we could learn something about the universal condition of humans. So how do we classify plays? Well, sometimes we can classify them just based on how long they are, their duration. Okay, a play can be, be any amount of time, actually. They have one minute play festivals. Yeah, these plays are one minute long. Excuse me. So, um, and then there is um, this nice uh, show called Nicholas Nickleby, which was actually on Broadway and it is nine hours long. It's an adaptation of a, um, um, I can't even think right now, the person who wrote Oliver Twist and A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, there we go, <laughs> Charles Dickens novel. Okay, but it's nine hours long, that's a long show. And then there's this other one called the Peony Pavilion, and if I'm saying that correctly, and there are 55 scenes in it, and it lasts three days. Um, your book talks about other um, shows. There's one that's 24 hours long, and it was actually some sort of a, a film, or a, excuse me, a music festival, but it went through music of every decade for 24 decades, from like 1776 you know, to today or something. Um, and people were walking out kind of, you know, bleary eyed after 24 hours of being in the theater. But um, so we can classify different types of plays based on their duration. That's one way to classify them. Um, a full length play though, typically in the United States and in Europe where we would normally go and see a play is usually two to three hours long. And usually there's an intermission in between. We can also classify plays by their genre. And there are two major genres of plays. There's comedy and there's tragedy. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about those things. Um, a play's genre is its type. Is it, is it a funny play? Is it a serious play? Um, is it, uh, you know, 
when we're talking about comedy and tragedy, sometimes that's rather subjective. And that means that what might, what I might classify as comedy, somebody else might not classify as comedy. So you, you kind of have to, we, we generalize these things, but understand that there are differences of opinion as to where things belong if you're classifying them. There are some other genres as well. There are melodramas. Um, these were very popular. They were actually serious. And now we mostly um, kind of poke fun at them and we use them as parodies. It's like, oh, oh, save me, save me, the damsel in distress. And, you know, the, the mean um, guy, you know, oh, you must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. And the hero, I'll pay the rent. Yeah, so, um, oh, my hero. That's what melodramas kind of were and are, but they're, they're, um, they take drama to a little bit of an extreme. There are good guys and there are bad guys. It's very clear cut. There are histories and um, King Richard III is one of these histories. Uh, Shakespeare did a lot of histories. So he did comedies, he did tragedies and then histories. And these were actually historical plays about real people. Of course, the words and everything are different that, that people say. Um, just like if we watched a historical movie about Martin Luther King, you know, it would be different, but it would be historically based. And that's how these plays are. There are things called documentary dramas. And um, basically, this one's about a, a young man named Freddie. Um, and it was shown in Montreal, Canada. And it was um, letters and emails and documents and things from his life. He happened to be a, a person who was shot by a policeman, I believe. So, but they look at the documents. That's how they um, structure the play is by their actual documents that, that they can read that are real. And then there are things called technology dramas. So they'll take um, theater and they kind of merge it with film and um, you get a lot of really interesting things. This is a little um, snippet to hear of Anastasia on Broadway. I happen to actually see this show on Broadway. And Anastasia is a real person standing there. And the rest of these are kind of, um, you know, they're computer animated kind of CGI images that are kind of dancing around her. So they immerse, you know, what we wouldn't think of as movies in with drama now. So there's a lot of genres that exist. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the big ones, tragedy and comedy. So tragedy, according to Aristotle, and he's the, he's the guy that we look to towards this. Uh, in the fifth century BC, Aristotle wrote what he thought tragedies were, and we have kind of all gone off of that. So according to Aristotle, a tragedy, it tells a story that does two things. One, it either ends in death or demise. So either somebody dies or somebody's life is ruined. Okay, that's a tragedy. And it also creates a catharsis. And this is a very important word, catharsis. And it's where the audience purges their emotions of pity and terror, according to Aristotle. So if you've ever seen like a really sad play or a really sad movie and it has driven you to tears and, um, but afterwards you kind of feel uh, like you've kind of gotten everything out, like you have purged yourself. Um, that's kind of what he was going for. He believed that catharsis was good for us because if we experience catharsis while watching a play, then, we didn't so much feel like we needed to go through those emotions in real life. We could kind of live vicariously through someone else and kind of feel the release of those emotions. And as any teenage girl will tell you, it's always good to have a good cry now and again. Um, but really, it, you, you can kind of go through these emotions and therefore in life, you, you wouldn't feel like you had to. So the protagonist, the protagonist is usually the main character of a play. That is, what, that is what the protagonist is. And in a tragedy, the protagonist is of high rank. So this is a king or a noble person or somebody who's 
well known and lofty. Okay, this is in tragedy. This is the the way that um, the tragedies are structured. Um, so the person needed to be um, of high rank, and they needed to possess a tragic flaw. So this is actually a picture of Oedipus Rex. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Which we will be reading later on in the semester here, and um, Oedipus is the king of the city, and his tragic flaw is pride. Um, he thinks that he's right, and he thinks other people are are wrong. So, um, your for a tragedy, you have to have somebody that's very high up, and they have to possess some sort of a tragic flaw, something that's wrong. Um, in a tragedy, there should be a moment of self-recognition of a fundamental mistake, like, uh-oh, what did I do? Um, I don't think it's a spoiler, because in your book, it tells you. Oedipus, basically, there was, a, um, there was a prophecy when he was a baby that he would kill his father and marry his mother. So um, his father uh, said, this is no, not good, don't want this to happen. So took him, pierced his ankles together and gave him to a shepherd and told the shepherd, go leave the baby on the hillside to die. Yeah, not a nice guy. But you know, if you think you're gonna die and you think your kid's gonna try to sleep with your wife, that's just kind of weird. So anyhow, um, what happened though was that another shepherd was out there and the first shepherd said, look, I don't wanna leave this baby here. Take it and take it far away to your land so that it won't ever come back here and it won't ever fulfill the prophecy. So the other shepherd said, okay, took the baby and gave it to the king and queen of another kingdom who raised him as their own. And he was very happy until one day he heard there was a prophecy about him that he was gonna kill his father and marry his mother. Well. He thought this was his father and mother, not realizing that he was adopted. So he said, um, I am going to leave. I'm not going to um, you know, stay around here anymore so that you know, this bad thing happens. So he decides to go over to Thebes, which happens to be where he's from. And on the way he meets Laos, who is his real father, but he doesn't know it. And all he knows is there's this man on the road and basically the roads were so small then it was like a whole bunch of people coming this way and a whole bunch of people coming this way. And one of them said, you guys got to move so we can get by. And the other one said, no, you got to move so we can get by. And they ended up fighting each other and Oedipus ended up getting in a duel with his real dad, not knowing it was his dad and killing him. But when he gets to the city, there's all this other chaos going on. There's a, a sphinx who is uh, telling him a riddle and he has to solve the riddle. Otherwise there's a plague on the city and everybody's dying. So he solves the riddle of the sphinx. Everybody cheers him, they applaud him. They say, you are wonderful. And you know what? Our king disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. So we're gonna make you king. And by the way, here's your queen which ended up being his mom, um, but he didn't know. And yeah, he had four kids with her, ew. Um, so in this play, the way that this is told, there is a moment of self-recognition of a fundamental mistake. Oedipus at one point realizes, wait a minute. Uh, I mean, the play starts out where everybody's having another plague. And uh, he's going, what's wrong? What's wrong? And they're like, well, there's another plague. And they're like, well, why is there another plague? Well, let's go talk to the Oracle. Well, the message comes back from the Oracle. It's because the other king died and nobody's ever avenged his death. He's like, well, let's avenge him. Let's, let's, we need to kill the guy who killed your last king, not knowing it's himself. So at some point he realizes, oh, I messed up. And that's when uh, he figures it all out. Um, this is a, a, a blind seer that he's talking to, and the blind seer is the one that's saying, uh, you know, you don't want to probe into this anymore. It's going to kind of mess up your life. And um, the king's like, yes, I want to know. I want to know. He's like, you really don't. <laughs> he's like, yes, I do. I'm, I'm going to torture you and kill you, you know, if you don't tell me what's wrong. 
like, okay, you asked for it. So uh, in a tragedy, then this particularly high figure has to experience a decline in fortune. You can imagine, uh, yeah, it doesn't end very well. Um, the wife realizes, oh my gosh, I've had kids with my son. And so she goes and she hangs herself. And um, Oedipus, of course, he loved her as his wife and realizes this is all so screwed up. And he takes the, the pins, the brooches that are holding her, um, her tunic together and he gouges out his own eyes so that he is still alive, but that he can't see the horrible things that he's done. Yeah, that's kind of a decline in fortune. And his brother-in-law takes over and says, you know what, uh, you're bad dude. And um, my sister just died and yeah, I'll take care of your kids, but you got to get out of here. You got to leave the city. So he has a complete, you know, that would say a decline in fortune. Yeah, he is, he's kind of messed up for the rest of his life there. Um, but he's not a victim. Um, he, he is a hero in the tragedy and, and a hero in the sense that he is a, a lofty person who has fallen because of his own pride, because of his own hubris. Um, and so he's not necessarily a, a victim. Uh, so same with many other tragic heroes. They're not victims, they're still strong. So, and um, they face conflicts against superhuman antagonists. So, you know, this, he's working against prophecies. He's working against oracles and um, the Sphinx and, you know, all these superhuman antagonists as well as his own self. So that's a little bit about tragedy there. Okay, so the goal of tragedy is to ennoble us. It's not to sadden us. It's not to make us sad, although we do go through those, um, that catharsis and that purgation of the soul. But it's, it's for us to think, okay, I don't wanna be like that. I want to be better. And so how do I be better? So there are many examples of tragic heroes and characters um, you know, Oedipus is just one of those. This is a modern version of Oedipus. Um, there is a, a play by Arthur Miller who wrote in the um, 1950s, I think. Um, and it's called um, Death of a Salesman. And the character there is named Willie Loman. And so this is Willie Loman. And he is a regular kind of an everyday guy, but he's, and he's a salesperson, but he also has tragic flaws he uh, kind of thinks really highly of himself, but then he does things that are not so good. I won't go through the whole story there, but you know, he is another tragic character that in the end ends up dying. So um, there are tragedies, you know, still today. Okay, let's move on to comedy. Um, hilarity is created through common devices. So there are things that universally people think are funny. Uh, sometimes we don't even have to have words and sometimes uh, you could go see something in a different country in a different language and still realize the humor that's going on. So if you full stage chases, people that are you know chasing everybody around the building and stuff like that. And we see them kind of, you know, um, we, we call it the, the Keystone Cops. Um, were uh, so in the um, when film first came out, they were a, a comedy group of policemen who would just um, kind of run all over the place and kind of bang into each other and stuff like that. And um, in silent movies, and that's what I think about when they're talking about the full stage chases and stuff. Um, mistaken identities. Um, this is actually a play um, uh, by William Shakespeare. Um, Oh my goodness, my son was in it. I'm having like a brain moment. Uh, but mistaken identity, there are two uh, servants that look exactly alike and there are two masters that look exactly alike. They're both like twins separated at birth and they think they are the other one. And the master's telling this one, hey, I told you to go and sell that necklace. And he's saying, hey, you didn't tell me anything. And he whacks him, you know? So there's all this mistaken identity and, um, you know, we all find it funny because we know what's really real. Um, there are a lot of sexual puns. 
you know, throughout comedy, you'll, you'll hear a lot of times people say something, you know, innuendos and uh, clever disguises, people who are dressed as something else. We especially find it funny when there's, you know, some guy trying to dress like an old woman and trying to get away with it. And so um, these are kind of universal comedy themes. Um, and in comedy, it's different than tragedy because in tragedy, remember we're talking with noble people or um, people of some high birth or high status in some way. And comedy is usually thought about ordinary people and ordinary circumstances. Um, you know, if we see a, you know, a, a king that has some sort of a, you know, funny thing happened to him, we think it's mildly funny. But if we see somebody like ourselves or somebody that we could identify with in some sort of a circumstance, um, it, it brings it a little more home to us. So comedy is usually about ordinary people in ordinary circumstances rather than lofty and king-like. Um, comedy doesn't have the same historical reputation as tragedy. So we will, we, yes, we do have comedies from the fifth century BC, but they are not as um, broad and well-known as the tragedies that we have like Oedipus. They kind of lose their popularity sooner than tragedies do. Um, however, some masterpieces have survived from the Middle Ages. Um, well, not the Middle Ages, past the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance. Moliere um, is one of them. Moliere is a playwright like William Shakespeare. And um, he wrote a play called Tartuffe. And I actually saw a version of this play um, last semester in Incarnate Word um, University, University of the Incarnate Word. Put it on and um you know this this um guy is trying to seduce this woman and her husband's under the table and uh some of these things are just hysterical so anyhow dramaturgy that word is very interesting because it means a person but it also means what you're doing with the play so it's the words how the action of the play is structured so I told you the story of Oedipus Rex, but um, just like I could tell you the story of, you know, um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears or Little Red Riding Hood or something else, but it's how it's told, who actually says what and in what order and how is it listed and who walks in first and then who walks in and then what did they say to each other? So the way that we structure a play you know, this is just a three act structure, but we structure plays in many different ways. We have five act plays, we have two act plays. So the drama's components, um, we have six components plus an extra, all right? <laughs> when we're talking about um, the elements of drama and how it all flows together, Aristotle came out with six of them. Um, plot, characters, thought, diction, music, spectacle, okay? Those are the six he came up with. We also add something called convention. And we're gonna go through all of these in a little more detail here. But these are the components that make up any drama. All right, drama also has a timeline. There's things that happen before you ever see the play. So there's pre-play, then there's actually the play and the post-play. So there's the before, during, and after also in a drama. This is all considered part of the dramaturgy. All right, let's look at the seven components. Again, I call it the six plus one because it's Aristotle's six components. I'm sorry, you're hearing my dryer buzz. Uh, Aristotle's six plus the one extra about conventions. So really quickly, and then we'll go through them in more detail. Plot is the structure of the actions, both external what's happening and internal why it's happening. So, um, you know, what is happening? Oh, there's a curse on uh, Thebes, you know, in Oedipus. And why is it happening? Well, it's happening because they haven't avenged the, you know, um, the death of the king. It's also external what's happening to the character and then 
their internal struggle. Well, what do I, what am I have to think about this? What am I doing about this? So, um, I, and the character is the person in the play uh, formed by the text and performed by an actor. The actor is not the character. The character is whoever is written in the play and the actor steps in and creates that character. A thought, oops, the concepts and arguments that result, um, that emerge as a result of the performance. So thought and theme, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Diction is the intelligence and the appropriateness of the speeches, the actual words, how they're put together. Um, music is the song or orchestration in a production. And spectacle is the visual aspect of the production. Okay, the glitz and glitter and stage uh, jazz hands and things like that. Um, the seventh component, like I said, that added on to Aristotle's is called convention. And it's these are agreements that we have between the audience and the performers. And we'll go into some of those. All right. So first, let us look at plot. Okay. Plot is not just the story. Okay. I gave you the story of Oedipus Rex. And that's just kind of the basic story. But the plot also deals with why things happen, not just that they happen. So yeah, Oedipus, you know, um, is raised by another couple. He goes, he kills the king, he marries his mother, then he gouges his eyes out. It's, it's like, what, 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 why? Why does that happen? What, and, and how did those, what circumstances let those things evolve? So you want to know why. Why does Scar kill Mufasa in The Lion King? Okay, why is it? Well, we know that he does kill Mufasa, but the why is the really more important. He does it so that he can be king instead of Mufasa. Okay, so Scar battle Mufasa in The Lion King. Okay, then there's the character. And the character is the primary material from which plots are created. If, if you know, you have, a, you have people that are saying things, these characters are embodying whatever it is that you want to say. So that is how the plots are created with people talking with the characters. Um, they are fictional based on writing but they seem human, the qualities they possess, although um, they only become human to us when they're performed. If you're reading about it, you know, it's still a character in a book or on a page. But if you're actually seeing it in front of you, enacted, that character becomes real, it becomes human to us. So, and the way that the actor portrays the character can mean all the difference. Um, next is thought. And thought is kind of the same as theme. Um, the arguments, the overall meaning, what is expressed. At the end of the show, when you are walking away, what is it that you feel? Um, what is it that your, your lingering message is? Oh, I don't want to have so much pride that I ignore the obvious like Oedipus did. Okay, so whatever thought, whatever meaning is in the end of the story, that's what, you know, you would take with you. So sometimes it's pretty obvious. So this is a, a little snippet from Lysistrata, which is a Greek play. Uh, this is a Greek comedy um, from the fifth century BC. And basically all the women in both warring towns decide that they're not going to have sex with their husbands, okay? Nobody is giving it up. Nobody can have sex until the war's over and they get the men <laughs> to stop fighting. So, um, you know, it's, that's, and so the thought is, okay, they wanna stop war. So, you know, there's that. Um, this is a little snippet from um, Fiddler on the Roof, oops back there for a second fiddler on the roof and i don't know if you've ever seen the show but it's all about tradition 
and holding on to traditions and trying to hold on to an old way of life that is kind of dying. So these are the thoughts and the meanings and everything. And that it's important in a play. So we have the plot, which is not just the story, but how it's presented. We have the characters, how do they flesh it out? And like, what kind of meaning are we making out of this play? What is it that it's expressed? Then diction, how do they say what it is that they're saying? Okay, sometimes they can say it in poetry or if you've ever seen Seussical, you know, or even listened to a Dr. Seuss book, you know, it's kind of sing-songy and rhymy, um, similar to Shakespeare, actually. Shakespeare wrote in a lot of rhyme and rhythmic speech. It's called iambic pentameter. And Dr. Seuss writes in, I guess it's iambic chordameter. So instead of five beats, there are four. It's like, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. <laughs> so it's, um, how is that diction repeated and how, how in a play, how is it expressed? Um, it could be in a soliloquy. We have Hamlet who's talking about, you know, um, his, a skull that has been dug up or whatever. And, but he's giving a heartfelt um, soliloquy, which is basically all by himself talking, but we hear his thoughts. Okay, so the language that is used to present that is something that's different. And um, this is a, a clip from a show called Wiley and the Hairy Man. And, um, there's a lot of rhythm in this show. So it's, um, they keep repeating things over and over. It's like, watch out Wiley, watch out Wiley. He done got your pappy and he's gonna get you. So, and, and they repeat it several times in the play. So using diction, you can use it all different ways to express the characters and the plot. Okay, music. When we think of music in a play, there's a lot of different ways that music can be used. And it's really kind of all pattern sound, even those rhythms are considered kind of the music of the play. But we use music in many different ways. So we use scene change music. Um, we use background music. I have Oedipus Rex here because I, when uh, I was in college, I actually, that was my job. I had to sit behind the stage and have the music going the entire time that the actors were acting, okay? So it was kind of like a score. It was music, kind of groaning music underneath everything they did. There's also incidental songs. So it could just be a scene change and you have music going on during the scene change or a character is humming or whistling. So in the show, A Blythe Spirit, there is a particular um, record that's played and it's called Always and it, it brings back one of the ghosts. So the music is used for that purpose. In the show Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, um, the, the main character Brick, he whistles all the time. So that is also kind of indicative of his character but it's also using music in the show. And then there's also using it, I don't know why all these pictures didn't come up, but um, it's integral, like in a musical. If you watch Phantom of the Opera or Cats or High School Musical, um, if you don't have music, you don't have a show. So sometimes music is very, very important. Okay. Last is spectacle. And spectacle is all the visual elements of the production. Spectacles are actually glasses. These are called spectacles. So when you think spectacle, it, you see it with your spectacles, okay? <laughs> it's just to remind you that spectacle is what you see. Okay, it could be lighting. Um, there could be some dramatic lighting. There could be, um, it could be your sets, your stage scenery. It could be furniture. It could be anything that you see, uh, costumes. Um, if you notice, this is one dancer and they um, have this costume on as they're running, um, all these uh, gazelles are running with them and the different costumes of the people there in The Lion King. I just think it's a beautiful show. <laughs> 
But all of these things fall under spectacle. All right, the seventh thing, conventions. There are different conventions that we use in the theater and, um, and it's an understanding, like I said before, between the audience and the performers and, and the people that are working in the theater. So we know that when the lights dim on the audience, the play's gonna start, okay? That's one of our conventions, we know this. Okay, we know that when an actor speaks to the audience and everybody else is frozen on stage, time has stood still. Everybody else behind is like stopped and this person is talking to you, you know that the people behind him can't hear him in the, in the world of the play and that time has kind of stood still while this one character is talking to you. Um, and when an actor says, wow, it's cold, we believe that they are somewhere cold. We know that whatever it is that they're saying, we need to kind of believe. If they say, oh my goodness, this desert goes on for miles, we believe they're in a desert. So these are stage conventions that we um, as audience members understand. Okay, the timeline I talked to you about, the pre-play, the before the play, transitions the audience into the world of the play. What are the things that happen before the play starts? Well, first we have to attract people to the theater. They have to attract the audience to come to the theater. Um, oh, historically, the way that they attracted people to come to the theater, they would raise a flag in Shakespeare's day, they would raise a flag that would say, oh, today we're, um, we're doing a play. Oh, they saw a flag, they'd say, hey, today's a play. We need to, everybody get ready. We're gonna go see the play. Um, there would be procession, processions like uh, parades almost that went through and advertised. Sometimes people would give speeches, come and see us. You know, we still kind of do this sometimes. Oh, excuse me. And then today, a lot of the times though, we use posters and billboards and advertisements and television and um, flyers and things that say, come see the show. All this stuff happens before the show. Then we get the audience to sit down and we shift the focus from all the pre-stuff to actually the play. Um, the audience members are seated. The mood of the play might be set with mood lighting and stuff like that. And then the audience all becomes a community. Everybody in that audience is experiencing that show, that time, that place. Then we move into the timeline, the actual play. So during the play, um, we have, uh, there's four important things that happen during a play. Excuse me a second. And sip that water. Okay. The play is divided into four sections and that they're, these are very important. The four features are, first is exposition. Okay. This gives the audience background information and structure. So when these characters walk out onto the set and they said, wow, Joey, you sure have grown. Well, all right, we know that whoever it is that is seeing Joey uh, hasn't seen him in a while and Joey has grown during that time, okay? And they said, well, you know, um, gee, when was the last time you were here? Oh, it must have been, you know, two winters ago when, you know, Sally got married. Okay, so now we know, the audience knows Sally got married. Okay, who's Sally? We're not sure, but it was two winters ago. So we are learning all these things about the world of the play just by what the characters say. And the beginning of it, when we're getting all this stuff is called exposition. It gives us our background, where we're going, what we're, what we're listening to. Then there's the conflict, okay? And this establishes characters' decisions and personalities, and it kind of makes the play dramatic. The, um, the characters' decisions like a conflict, this could be, oh, these two people are in love, but they're married to other people, and or they're the different places in society, or whatever the you know, circumstances are. But 
this is what creates the conflict, okay? So there's, there's something that wants to happen that can't happen, or there's something that clashes, okay? And that's what makes a play dramatic. The climax is the most extreme part of the conflict, okay? It's the big battle here. I'm not sure why this picture is out here the whole time, um, but it's the big battle. This is the climax. We are fighting and whoever wins is going to rule the land. And then last is called the denouement. And it literally means the untying or unraveling of the knot. It's okay, everybody died, the battle's over. Now what happens? Somebody comes in and explains all the pieces of the play that we don't know exactly how we're gonna fall into place and kind of ties it all up at the end. And that's called the denouement. That's the end of the play. Then we go to the post play, which is the afterwards. So this is the ending agreement between the audience and the performers. This is when we have the curtain call, the um, you know, actors bow, the show is over, and um, we expect a curtain call. We expect audience, we expect actors to come out and bow. And this started a long time ago when um, the actors were showing who they were, they would take off their masks, you know, in the Greek theater or whatever, and show, I am just this person, I am not really that character, so that the audience can see that they're a person and they're not really the mean character or whatever they were portraying. Um, I read somewhere in the, uh, that it, it used to be that the actors would bow and if they didn't do a good enough job, the whoever was paying them would like chop off their head. So um, that's what the bow was about originally. I was like, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <clears throat> so hopefully don't lop off anybody's head if you don't like it, but, uh, but we still do the bow. Um, and they, we, they bow to our applause. We, you know, if they're really wonderful, then, you know, we all stand on our feet and clap and cheer and hoot and holler and um, give what's called a standing ovation. I had a friend of mine who's an actor he posted something on Facebook last night that said, we got a standing ovation, either that or everybody decided that they needed to all stretch simultaneously, you know, <laughs> at the end of the show when we were bowing and everybody stood up. So, um, but it's how we show appreciation to the audience. And there's a recognition that we have shared something with these actors. They're bowing to us. They're right there in front of us. We were there too. We saw what they did. The post play doesn't really end there though, because afterwards we kind of continue it outside the theater. So there's discussion and debates. What did you think they meant when they said this? I don't really like the way that actor did such and such. So we talk about it afterwards. Um, there are published reviews and scholarly articles and actors are interviewed and, you know, how did you feel when you were, you know, portraying this character and stuff. And there's dramatic criticism. I don't know if any of you have seen the Muppets, these are the critics, they're always <laughs> saying bad things. But, um, you know, actors are told, oh no, don't wanna, can't, no, no software update right now. Um, so actors are told that, you know, go ahead and read what the um, critics write about you, but don't believe it if it's bad um, because you're supposed to still keep a good attitude. But there's a lot of people that will say that they liked or didn't like what happened in the play. So that concludes uh, this chapter two discussion. Um, I hope you got something out of it. And if you have any questions, as always, let me know. Take care.